So that was a digital cell, um, both as an input and an output. Um, but what about the analog I.O. cell? So if you need to have some sort of an analog voltage, you'll have a, a, an analog cell in your library. And basically, uh, an analog cell, we don't want to put a digital buffer or something to turn uh, some sort of analog voltage into a zero or one. So we, what we need is a wire. So we go from the pad. From the bonding pad into the uh, into the internal part of the chip, and maybe we have some sort of a very very small metal resistor. We don't want to put anything big because it'll ruin our voltage. But at least to to take some of the uh, some of the voltage in case we have one of these ESD um, things. Um, what we need to do is we need to add ESD clamps uh, to these things. Uh, it, tends to be more complicated than the standard digital way, but uh, that's out of the scope of this uh, talk. So basically, it's just a wire. Okay, and finally, we have the power uh, supply cells and how they uh, provide this ESD protection. So again, the power supply cells, similar to the analog pads, they're, they're, um, they're just a wire that connects VDD or ground into the chip. But it's not only that, because what we do usually is in our pad ring, if we're talking about a wire bonded design or a design with the IOs on the periphery, what we'll do is we'll provide these rings all around the chip that will have the different voltages, VSS, VDD, VSS IO, and VDD IO, those four voltages we need in each pad. That way, if I take some sort of a pad and I stick it over here, it will be able to get all the voltages it needs, similar to the way that inside the chip we provide VDD and ground for any standard cell. We just stick this here and it can take uh, tap these four voltages. Okay, so um, what we need to do with the power pins, the power uh, IOs, is we need to stick our power IO here, and let's say this is a VDD one, so VDD is this blue color here, so it has to have a short to um, this rail here, and then it will provide power all around the chip. Okay, um, and then next to it, we might have a VSS one that will have a short to this red wire, and there we'll have a VDD IO one, and it will short to the um, purple wire, okay? So we're gonna have to have uh, a bunch of these all over the place. Uh, how many of them do we need? Well, it depends on the current we need inside the chip that will, uh, each of these uh, power pads will be able to supply a certain amount of current. So we need to see what our power, our current dissipation for the whole chip is and provide VDD VSS pads accordingly. And um, we'll discuss in a minute how we d decide what we have to have for the IO um, supplies. Okay, so that so the one thing they do is they provide this um, VDD and VSS that goes into these rings. Second of all, uh, we'll need the VDD and VSS inside the chip. So these power rails, let's say this one is VDD and this one is VSS, they need to somehow connect to um, this guy and this guy. Often what we'll do is we'll, as we discussed before, we'll put another ring inside because these things are um, are buried inside the left of our um, of, of our pads and we can't really uh, connect to them. So what we'll often do is we'll put another ring around that this guy will connect to here and this guy will connect to here because there'll be a pin here that we'll be able to connect to. Um, but in general, we don't necessarily need it because we actually have these rings inside. Um, and you can also sometimes need to tap the VSS IO or VDD IO uh, if you need a higher voltage inside the cell and there'll be usually a special uh, library cell to do that, okay? Um, so uh, that's that's basically what we do with these uh, um, uh, with these IOs, but they also provide our uh, our our ESD protection. So remember that in each uh, of these digital IOs, right, we have to have uh, we have our pad signal that goes in, and in the end here we have uh, some sort of a regular inverter, and we don't want this thing to be burned out. So what we need to do is we need to add these two. Um, diodes well where uh, and they have to be connected to a high voltage on one side and low voltage on the other side so how are we going to do that we're going to have uh, diodes inside this io cell and uh, um, we're gonna since we have the rails all of these four rails inside we can just connect the top of the diode to vddio the bottom of the diode to vssio and we'll have actually 
pairs of these diodes to all of the different uh, uh, power rails. So the VDD, VSS, VDD IO, and VSS IO. Um, of course, we have to watch out if we have all kinds of uh, analog voltages or special negative voltages and so forth. Um, it may be detrimental to actually connect the um, the, uh, the, the ESDs, so you have to make special clamps for that and figure out ways around it, okay? Um, so that's power supply cells and ESD protection. Simultaneously switching output, or SSO, is a metric that describes the period of time during which switching starts and finishes. So, for example, if we have a, a large output bus, like a 64-bit bus, if all of them transition from high to low uh, at the same time, which could be a type of a worst case, uh, a very large amount of current must be driven or sunk, uh, which will cause a, a voltage drop because of LDIDT uh, on, on the VDD, on the package, okay? And this is an independent problem of frequency. So when we're going to have this uh, SSO metric is going to help us figure out how many IO power supplies are needed, okay? This is an, there's another thing about that. Well, let's say that uh, VDD and uh, VDD IO were the same voltage, or we know that usually VSS and VSSI are the same voltage. We're still going to usually separate them into two separate um, domains. And the reason is that we have our chip, right? And inside we have our core, which is running on one volt or whatever we're having. And it's uh, doing all this stuff. And our it's very, very sensitive to little variations in, in noise. We don't want it to drop to half a volt or else our circuit's not going to work. Then again, we have these big guys and these big guys are going to be driving these huge capacitors outside and that's going to be a, a big current drop at a certain time especially if we have simultaneously switched outputs that means that the the the, the, the if we have an inverter here that's driving that the this guy is going to be very very noisy okay because of LDITT so we want to really separate them in any case both the VDD and the ground to a separate um, voltage domain than what's driving these guys so we won't get uh, noise on the digital voltage even though we have these big switching uh, things happening on the on the IO voltage so that's why we'll usually separate them in any case so a few design guidelines for power we should put as many mutual capacitances as possible between the IC and the voltages. Remember that the way to fight with this LDIDT drop is to put capacitance that will offset it. Um, so a capacitor is basically a storage of charge. So if we have some sort of a, a, a need for current, we can supply that charge uh, directly from a capacitance that's really close. And we discussed that we use decap cells and so forth to put uh, capacitance on, on the chip and so forth. But um, usually these capacitances are very small. Uh, outside the chip, we can put bigger capacitors. So, for example, we'll stick um, capacitors all over the place on our uh, on our package. If we have, for example, just a package with all these, uh, like a BGA type of thing with all these bumps, we can just stick capacitors in between these little uh, bumps on the chip. No problem. We can get much bigger capacitors than we had outside. Or if we have our uh, wire bonds or whatever, we can stick capacitors between VDD and ground just to uh, improve the capacitance. We'll have it also on our printed boards and on our voltage regulators. We'll have it everywhere, uh, as much capacitance as we can put. Okay, put as many supply voltage pins as possible. If we have extra pins, why not just add more connections to provide more supply voltages? It will uh, make us have uh, less um, IR drop. Um, less LDIDT. Um, put supply and ground supply voltages as close as each other as possible. Again, same uh, effect. Provide separate supply voltages for the core and IOs as we discussed before so there won't be noise on the core. Reduce inductances as much as possible by using as short transmission lines as possible. So um, again, outside the chip, these things are going to be transmission lines and uh, the higher the inductance, the harder it is, we'll get more reflections. And uh, usually what we do is we do some sort of uh, impedance um, tuning. So we'll make sure that these IOs, they actually show a 50 ohm impedance. And then all of the test equipment and whatever and anything that connects will also have 50 ohm. And these things will be tuned. And then we won't get reflections. Okay. Um, so that's basically uh, what I wanted to say over here. Okay. Okay. Uh, Another point is what we call pad configurations. So if we're talking about a wire bond and we're talking about pads that are around the periphery, the standard way of doing it is what we call inline pad configuration. So we put these IO cells one next to the other and 
each IO cell is connected to a bond pad. Okay, again, the bond pad is just a stack of metals that uh, enables us to connect this wire bond. Okay, and they're next to each other, right? And so they're in line with each other. Um, uh, and there's a small gap between them, and often the bond pads are wider than the actual IO pad would have to be. But that causes, uh, I mean, the, the, the pitch between the bond pad is usually what drives the whole pitch. And uh, obviously, the length of each side is how many of these uh, bond pad and uh, IO cell pairs we can put on the side of the chip. So it means that we can't put that many on. Okay. To alleviate the problem a little bit, and again, since the, the pitch of the bond pad is really set by how uh, we can actually connect our um, wire bond, we can do something which is called staggering. We can take one uh, bond pad, put it underneath the other one, and then we can um, stagger them like that. Um, since the IO cells can be thinner than the actual bond pad, we can get an effective um, width of the IO cells that's like two bond pads or something like that. Um, it costs us a bit in this, the area that's like wasted over here, but we can actually get a, a, a larger number of bond pads and therefore a larger number of interfaces to the chip. So that's called staggered. Um, however, it can be even better if we do what what's called the CUP or circuit under pad. So in this case, we can design our IO cells that they won't go up too high um, in metals, and then we can stick our bond pad on top of the actual IO cells. So we can do this staggering, if you see the bond pads over here and over here, we can do this staggering on top of the actual um, IO cell, and that way we don't have this wasted area that we would have over here that's really wasted just used for the bonding pad, and we can save uh, expensive silicon real estate. Of course, we have our flip chips and, and flip chip technology. This is a, a kind of irrelevant because we can put our circuits wherever we want, our IO circuits. They don't have to look like this. They don't have to be next to each other. We do have to make sure they're provided with um, the both the uh, IO and uh, core voltages and the, the SD protection. But so often we do put them in areas that they're close to each other. But then again, we can take uh, using this RDL, this redistribution layer, and provide the signals and the power to anywhere any one of these bumps we have scattered all over the chip. So that's uh, all I wanted to discuss about IOs for right now, and I'm going to stop for a moment uh, to discuss uh, our Chip Hall of Fame for today. So most chips are covered by a package, but if you take certain chips like image sensors, then the package will be um, uh, scraped off because you have to have the uh, silicon exposed to the outside. And here is the first image sensor um, that was uh, commercially sold, which is the Kodak KF1300, and it's a 2017 inductee into the IEEE Hall of Fame. So this is the chip that brought digital photography outside the lab. Um, image sensors were were invented uh, a while before that in the 70s, um, also in Kodak, and they had them. They were used in like um, experiments, lab, and and so forth. But this is the first commercially available um, uh, DSLR was sold with uh, this chip inside it. It was released in 1991. It used a CCD um, technology, and it had 1.3 megapixel resolution, and that was a big deal. Passing the one megapixel um, uh, barrier enabled making very uh, good resolution pictures that you could actually go and print out. Um, this was sold as a uh, Nikon F3 body, where, where they replaced the film with this image sensor, and you had to connect it to this external uh, five kilogram data storage unit and image processing unit um, which you had to carry around with you if you wanted to carry around your digital imager and look at that to buy one of these things the initial price was something around twenty five thousand dollars it went uh, it lowered down to about 20 uh, 20 K a bit later on um, it had a 200 megabyte hard disk inside this thing this five kilogram big thing and that could take 156 raw images so you had to carry this thing around on your soldier uh, on your shoulder strap so that's our um, chip hall of fame for today